Start with God's Word, Romans chapter 1, verse 25. We looked at this verse before because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creation or create or creature, sometimes the translation says creature, rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And my clicker's not working. I thought I had it fixed. Then this is what we did last time. For this reason, God did what? Gave them up to what? Hey, hey, Aubrey. To what? You remember? It's always a word. It's hard for me to remember too. But dishonorable. Yeah, dishonorable passions. For their. Remember, he was talking about lesbianism. For their what? Women. Exchange natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. That's it. God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Dishonorable passions. Not honorable, dishonorable. Passions, lust, desires. They're women. He says exchange natural relations. God made women. God made men to have natural relations in a husband-wife relationship. They exchange that for those that are contrary to nature. You say, well, maybe he's not talking about lesbianism. Maybe he's talking about something else. No, he's talking about lesbianism. All the way through here, he's talking about the, the sexual passions and lust. And here it gets even clearer in the next, the next verse because he's talking about the men here. And the men likewise gave up natural relations again with women. So they gave up natural relations with women and were, this means eaten up, consumed. Very good. Consumed with passion for one another. Men committing, uh, yeah, it's acts. And this is different than sinful, but it, it means, means the same thing. It means embarrassing, shameful. I think this translation actually says shameless, like they don't have any shame. Uh, so men committing shameless acts, acts that they should be embarrassed about, but they're not. And, and that's, that's what we have in our country today. People are doing these things. Homosexuals are behaving in ways as if this is perfectly natural and normal. It's perfectly good. And we shouldn't be ashamed about it. But God says, no, it's shameful. And, they sure, and they're shameless. And that's what we're dealing with, just like they were in the Roman Empire. Acts with men. And this means getting, receiving in themselves the, this is what, they ought to get. This is the. Sometimes we'll use this in terms of payment. You know, if you, if, if you order something, you don't pay for it. You, you have to. Well, dead is a good guess. That's not. I especially can see why he said that. But it means this is what is due. Very good. Very good. Receiving themselves the due. Payment for their. I hope I'm getting this right. I'm beginning to think I've not memorized this right myself. Listen, we're seeing this as a due payment for their. Hmm? I'm, I'm not sure about this word myself right now. I've forgotten. I said, now I'm going to give up natural relations with women who are consumed with passion for one another and committing shameless acts with men. We're seeing this as a due. You want to guess some words? We'll see what it is in just a minute. I may have it wrong myself. Come in, I'm thinking it's a word that's just equivalent of wickedness. Evil is what I think. Yeah. Error. <laughs> and, it's, and it's a due penalty for their error. So I missed this part of myself. Okay. i got to re-memorize that. The men likewise gave up natural relations with women. See, he, likewise means in the same way. That, so he says, you've got to go back and look at this previous verse. For this reason, God gave them up to desirable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations with men. It doesn't say it, but that's what he means. For those that are contrary to nature. Because he says, likewise, the men. The men likewise, in the same way, just like the women did, they gave up natural relations with women. And were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men. And receiving in themselves a due penalty for their error. Now, I know we're living in a day now when they say, well, it's not shameless. We're, we're, we're not. But that's what makes them shameless. They're saying, well, no, we're not embarrassed. We're open about it. God says you should be embarrassed. This is the kind of sexual sin he said we ought to be embarrassed about. They, they, they should be ashamed. 
There's another place, where is it? Ephesians chapter 5, maybe, where Paul says, it, it, it's a shame to even speak of what they do in private. We, we, we shouldn't even talk about it. It's so nasty. It's so embarrassing. Uh, and yet they do it, and they do it shamelessly now. Now, I know, I feel like I need to add a few things. We're going to talk about this more next, next quarter as, as part of our course. But I feel like now is a good time to say this, too. And I'll say it briefly. We'll say it in more detail later. There are people today who call themselves Christians who try to explain this away and say, no, it's okay for men to marry men or women to marry women. They call themselves Christians. And they say, because what Paul was talking about wasn't a loving relationship between two men in a, in a committed covenant relationship or two women in a committed covenant relationship. He was talking about uh, the kinds of things that were going on in the Roman Empire. By the way, they're going on in America today, too. But he was talking about maybe sexually sexual predators you know what i mean by predator they're, they're preying on other people especially kids maybe you know the, the roman empire that was common it's common in america today just covered up a lot but it's common or they were talking about maybe uh, maybe promiscuity where they were having sex with a lot of different partners and especially among men homosexual men that's very very common and and, and so they said well that's what he was talking about uh, or, or preying on kids and stuff like this. So, but but when you look up what was going on in the Roman Empire, they had men who were doing the same things that men say they're doing today. They had men who said, "No, we're in a we're in a covenant relationship, lifelong." Uh, there were homosexuals who behaved that way in the Roman Empire, just like they do today. God nowhere says, "Well, some kinds of homosexual behavior are okay; other kinds are not okay." Every time He talks about homosexual behavior, He talks about it as a sinful behavior. And we just got to accept that if we believe God's word. Now, you say, well, I don't believe God's word. Well, that's between you and God. You, you know, you got to make that decision whether you're going to believe God's word. Or not. But please don't claim to believe God's word and then try to say, but it's okay to do this because God says it's not. He says it's sin. If you want to say, I don't believe God's word, that's between you and God. You'll pay the consequences for that, too. But people have that choice, of course. You, you're a free moral agent. And, our, and we're living in a culture right now which is pushing as hard as they can for you to accept stuff that God says is sin. And accept it as okay. And uh, you're going to have to decide who, who, which side you're on and who you're going to stand with. Okay. Uh, you want to ask anything or say anything or talk about anything or pray about anything before I pray? Okay. Let's go ahead and say my spoken request. Okay. Anybody else have a prayer request? Everybody good? Well, Father, thank you for your word. And thank you, Lord, that you are a God of truth. And thank you that you tell us the truth in your word. And you don't mince words. Lord, thank you for that. Thank you that you make it very clear that homosexual behavior is sinful. And that we can try to jump through hoops or try to convince ourselves that it's not. But we're just deceiving ourselves. And Lord, we're living in a nation that's incredibly deceived right now. We have leaders that are horribly deceived. Uh, leaders in every way. We have government leaders. We have educational leaders. We even have so-called church leaders who are totally deceived because they're not wanting to live life your way. They're wanting to live life their way. They're wanting to excuse and rationalize sin. So Lord, please don't let us fall into that trap. Help us to have the courage to stand firm in the face of a, a world that's very hostile to, to us right now when we stand firm, but help us to decide your word is truth and to stand firmly in your word, in your truth. So, Lord, give these kids the courage they need and help them not to be deceived by the lies that smooth talking, slick talking people in the world who reject you and reject your truth and reject your word are trying to, to, to teach. So, Lord, please protect them. Now, Lord, we know that's not the only sin around. We, we, we're all guilty of sin, Lord, and we don't want to approve of any sin. We don't want to excuse or rationalize any sin. Whether it's lying or losing our temper or just having a generally bad attitude or being self-centered and selfish in our decisions and the way we want things to go our way all the time. Or whatever it might be, Lord, help us to be quick to repent of our sin. And Lord, if there's some kids in here who've never really, really come to grips with their sin problem and never really repented of their sin and never really put their trust and faith in Jesus, I pray that now would be the time when they would simply say, yes, Lord. I surrender. I'm sorry for my sin. I hate my sin. I want to trust Jesus and that they would trust Jesus and begin to live for Jesus. And Lord, I pray that, that, that they will show Jesus in their lives, Lord, that they will stand firm and be courageous 
and speak up when it's time to speak up. And Lord, that the ex very expression on our faces, the way we smile at people, the way we look them in the eye, the way we greet them, the way we encourage them, the way we listen to them, that they would, it would, they would see Jesus in us, that we wouldn't have this barrier up, that we wouldn't pretend to be something that we're not, or, or any, we don't want any fake or any hypocrisy. Lord, we just want to be open and honest before you and before other people. So help us to live that way. And Lord, today, as we learn a little bit more about archaeology and what, what you teach us through these incredible discoveries the archaeologists have made that confirm the historicity of your word, Lord, I pray that we'll learn those things well. These kids will learn it well enough so that they can share it with others uh, when they run into people who doubt your word. Lord, you know what Katie's unspoken request is? We lift that to you again and ask you to intercede and intervene and do what needs to be done in that situation. Lord, please be merciful. We pray for people who are sick, who are, who are hurting, people who, who are absent today and people who are... Uh, struggling with getting over different things or don't even know what it is sometimes we know there's a lot of flu there's still covid going around there's rsv or whatever it's called and there's other stuff Lord, that i don't even know stomach bugs and viruses and lord i just pray you protect people right now help us to be wise in the way we interact with people that way too we want to keep our bodies healthy as well as we can we know they're not ours really they're yours they're temples of your holy spirit so help us to walk uh, in, a, in a wise way with people when people are sick around us. So thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. Thank you for being with us. Thank you that you never, ever leave us. Help us to walk well with you today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm sorry. Oh, sure. Uh, let's see. Uh... I'll make sure I got everybody that came in here. Uh, Aubrey's here. Did Jackson? Jackson didn't come in yet, has he? Savannah did. And Sophie and Lily did. Okay, so right now, Lizzie, Grayson, Jackson are absent, right? Okay. All right. Uh, <clears throat> Oh, let's see. Next thing I want to do is this. Uh, I've got two videos on archaeology, and I want to uh, want you to see those. You know what archaeology is? Anybody know kind of off the top of your head? I, you know, I don't mean a formal definition, but you know what it is? What? Yeah, like they, they can dig into the rocks. The study of rocks per se is geology, but archaeologists dig into the rocks. Uh, do you know why? Yeah, uh huh. I just just make sure I guess what it is. Uh, yeah, they uh, they dig into the ground and into the rocks, and uh, what you know what they're looking for? Maybe sometimes fossils. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. The, the people that look especially at fossils are called paleontologists. But the, the archaeologists are looking for signs of past civilizations, you know, people and the way they lived and, and learning about people and places and things of the past kind of thing. So that's what we're looking at here. So the first question, you'll, you'll hear me talk about that on the video, is what is archaeology? Did everybody get a copy of this? Yeah. Uh, what is archaeology? What does archaeology study? How do archaeologists do their work? What's a common general word for things discovered by archaeologists? What do we call those things that they find? Number five. What did Jesus tell the Pharisees who tried to tell him to stop his followers from praising him? Number six, how does the age of archaeology, archaeological study, compare to the age of the study of biology, physics, and chemistry? I'm talking about how, how long men have been studying these things. Number seven, who's considered to be the father of archaeological excavation? Number eight, what was the status of archaeology in the mid-19th century? That would be in the 1850s, roughly, you know, in that area. Number nine, why were many historians of the past not willing to trust the Bible for historical information? Number 10, why did they assume it was mythological? Number 11, what are materialists in a metaphysical sense? That means like a philosophical sense. Number 12, what is mythology? Number 13, what are some general things that archaeologists are able to confirm? Number 14, how does archaeology help us obey 1 Peter 3.15? That's our theme verse. You know, that, that we'll be able to give an account to, to anyone who asks us a reason for the hope that's in us. 
Number 15, can archaeology prove that God wrote the Bible? Number 16, what's a stele? Now, you'll hear that pronounced different ways. It looks like steel, S-T-E-L-E, but the Greek word is stele, so I just pronounce it stele. Number 17, what kind of information was often recorded on a stele? And we'll finish the archaeology. We might do both of them today. I don't know. They're both kind of short, but this is this is what we're going to be looking for on the first one. Okay? Ready? Before, did you, you want to say anything before I start? Am I good? Okay. If somebody else comes in, make sure they grab one of those up there. And Carly, if you can get the lights, please. Funny video. If you've been keeping up with me, we've been looking at some of the powerful evidence that God has seen fit to meet with us that can help people who may be having doubts about it know that Jesus really is alive, that he really did rise from the dead. And so that's one of the things that would be very helpful to share with other people to show them the evidence that God's left so they can know that Jesus really is alive. But I want us to shift gears a little bit right now and is it for a few minutes to another fairly common objection hmm. that some people Is it too dark for you to see your paper? Can you see it? You can see it over here. Can you see it? It's a little dark. I'm going to open this just a little bit to give us a little more light. I think if I can do it without knocking over the. It's going to be a challenge for me here. Let's see. Uh oh, that's not good. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Appreciate your catching it. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do one other thing to make sure that thing is lined up correctly. Hold on just a second. Let me check something. That's probably close enough. It has to do with the Bible. There are people out there who have allowed themselves to be persuaded and we won't get into the reasons, the different reasons for this, that the Bible is just a book of myths. And they believe it's made up of stories, maybe about imaginary people and imaginary places that never really ever existed at all. Well, it turns out that God's left several lines of evidence to help people who have doubts about his word, about whether or not they can trust the Bible. For example, there's a line of evidence that we'll be looking at later from ancient manuscripts. There's also a line of evidence from looking at some early historical documents about the early church. There's a lot of evidence from fulfilled promises and they that pretty soon. So I'm eager to get to all those different lines of evidence, but we can only go so far, so fast, right? But I now want to take a few minutes to look at a lot of evidence that comes from the field of archaeology. Archaeology, you may or may not be familiar with archaeology, but one definition of archaeology is something like this. It's a systematic study of past human life and culture by the recovery and examination of the remaining material evidence, such as graves, buildings, monuments, inscriptions, tools, pottery. Now, I realize you can't write that fast, so if you want to jot down a few things, but that's the answer to number one. I'll eventually give you the paper with it on there printed. So. In other words, archaeologists are people who want to find out about the past. And the way they do it is they dig down into the earth to find where things have been covered up over a period of time. Things that were left there when people lived in those places maybe hundreds of years ago or even thousands of years ago. And so archaeologists find these things. We call them artifacts, by the way. That's number four. They find these artifacts. That's the answer to number four, artifacts. That will tell them information about what was going on in the past. It's kind of exciting. It's kind of like the rocks themselves are speaking to us from the past and giving us valuable information about what happened many, many, many years ago. It reminds me of something Jesus said one time about worship. I love this passage. You remember when Jesus was riding into Jerusalem on a donkey? Riding into this ministry on earth. Just before his crucifixion, 
his followers were excited about him coming into Jerusalem. They, they really believed at that point he was the Messiah. Now, they were going to change their minds pretty quickly because they didn't understand that he was going to be crucified and die and be buried and rise again. Uh, they just wanted him to be the king. So at the moment, they were just really, really excited. They were shouting and praising him and worshiping him. But that irritated the religious leaders. You know this? The Pharisees? The Pharisees tended to be very hypocritical people. They were really jealous of Jesus because a crowd, I mean, thousands and thousands of people were following Jesus. And those Pharisees wanted to praise for themselves, but not for Jesus. So the Pharisees came to Jesus very indignant and said, Tell your followers to be quiet. You know what Jesus said to them? This is really fascinating to them. He said, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And again, the very stones would cry out. And I think of that when I think of archaeology, because in a metaphorical kind of way, that's what's happening in the field of archaeology. The stones are crying out. <laughs> when the archaeologists dig into the rocks, they find things that cry out a story. They tell us a story. They tell us something about the past. And the fascinating thing is that the story they tell us confirms what we read in the Bible. So it turns out to be a very exciting field of study. Actually, archaeology is kind of a new science as far as science goes. It's not been around that long compared to things like chemistry or physics or biology. And those things have been around for not just hundreds but thousands of years. But the father of archaeological excavation is generally considered to be a man named William Cunningham. It's number seven. Who died in 1810. That may seem like a long time ago to you, but compared to the rest of the sciences, that wasn't that long ago. And even as late as the 1850s, the mid part of the 19th century, archaeology was still just kind of like a hobby. It was a pastime that some people got into for the fun of it, but it was considered to be something for amateurs. That's number eight. Professionals didn't do it. People didn't make money. It wasn't part of the educational system or anything like that. Nobody did it to make a living. Well, it turns out that archaeology is actually a friend of the Bible as it's developed. And I mean, God just kind of raised this field to study it up so that people can see these things. Here's how it works. For many years, people who studied history would find things that were mentioned in the Bible. Maybe it was a person, or maybe it was a place mentioned in the Bible, or maybe it was some event mentioned, or maybe a title of an official. And they could see it there in the Bible. But they could not find any reference to these things anywhere except the Bible. And so many of these historians would simply say, I don't think so. I don't think that really happened. I don't think that man really existed. I don't think that people really existed. I don't know the Bible talks about it, but we can't see any references to it anywhere else. And they said if it was really real, if it was really true, if it really happened, we would have some references to it somewhere else besides the Bible. And so they would conclude, we just can't trust the Bible about these things unless we can find some other references from, from other historical writings. So that was their attitude. And the reason that many of them did not want to trust this is the number Bible nine. had to do with their worldview. Many of these guys were materialists. In other words, they did not believe in the existence of a supernatural God. Or That's number 11. This is all mixed in together. And, of course, the Bible's full of supernatural things. It tells us that there's a supernatural God. And he's the one that created this whole universe and created us. The Bible tells us how he maintains his universe and how he has intervened from time to time and will intervene again in history supernaturally. Of course, it tells us how God the Son became a man. And he was born of the Virgin Mary, lived a perfect life, and died on the cross to pay for our sins, and was buried and rose again from the dead. That's supernatural. All of that's supernatural. That's miraculous. The Bible's full of miracles in the supernatural. And they didn't like it. They didn't like all this talk about miracles. They didn't like all this talk about supernatural stuff. They just kind of had a natural distrust of the Bible because of their anti-supernaturalistic bias. And so, if there was a place or a person or an event that was mentioned only in the Bible, they're saying, well, Bible writers probably just made this stuff up like they made up this stuff about the miracles. Am I making sense to you here? You get the picture? The Bible talks about all these supernatural things, and they felt very confidently 
They knew that stuff couldn't possibly have happened. Miracles don't happen. Because the real people, they thought they knew that those things were made of stories. Had to be. So they assumed that the rest of the Bible was just made of stories as well. That it couldn't trust it. But, along came the archaeologists. And they began to dig into the earth. And they began to find things that were left there thousands of years ago in some cases. And they started finding inscriptions on monuments. And one of the things I'll have They started finding things with lots of information. And lo and behold, they began to find the names of these people, and these places, and these events that were talked about in the Bible in the Orientals. And so the more open-minded archaeologists, the ones who were honest and wanted to know the truth, even if it was supernatural, they began to say, mm, looks like the Bible may have been accurate after all about some of these things. Now listen, we have to be just a little bit careful here that we don't assume too much when we're talking about archaeology. I want to make sure you understand this at the very beginning. I'm talking about number 15 now. Archaeology really cannot prove that God is the one who wrote the scriptures. And we know he did. And God's left other ways to demonstrate that. He's left other evidence so that we can realize he has to be the author of this book. A, a wonderful example of that is fulfilled prophecy. We'll get to that later. So archaeology can't confirm that God's the author of the book. But archaeology can confirm that the people and places and events we read about in the scripture are not just imaginations. They're not just made up. They're not just mythological. So it turns out that many of them are not only recorded in scripture, but they're recorded on artifacts that we find in rocks and the earth. So archaeology can confirm that the people who read about the Bible actually did this. And so, for many people who were skeptics, when they started seeing the results of archaeology, it kind of helped them get more confidence that we win in it. Maybe the Bible really is reliable. Maybe it can be trusted. And you know what that can do? It can lead archaeologists, and it has led archaeologists, to take the Bible more seriously. And some of them, it's led them to be, it's kind of proven to be a door for them that God has used to bring them to faith in Jesus. Pretty awesome and exciting. So the study of archaeology can help us to see this stark contrast between the Bible, on one hand, which has historical basis, it's historical detail that can now be verified, and other works of antiquity that really are pure mythology. Well, there's a lot of mythology, there's a lot of fiction that was written many, many years ago. For example, this is somebody's imagination of what the Greek god Thor might have looked like, which is just an artist's imagination drawing. But of course, we know that Thor is a totally fictional character. So men of the past with very creative minds really have written some fascinating stories, pure fiction. They have been creative stories about things that supposedly happened maybe far, far away, long, long ago. There's no confirmation possible because it's not anchored in history at all. It's pure fiction. We call it mythology. The Bible is very, very different. It is not like ancient mythology at all. There are people who want to put the Bible in the same category as mythology because of the miracles. But archaeologists have made that impossible. The Bible is not mythology. It's historical. For example, one kind of archaeological object that's been found turned out to be very, very valuable to archaeologists. It's an object called a stele. Stele. The word stele is just a transliteration of a Greek word, stele. But it refers to an upright stone slab, and usually it's engraved with writing. So archaeologists can learn things if they can figure out how to translate these things and read the writing, and they handle it. These stele were often used to commemorate great events. Sometimes they contain the history of an important battle that was fought in ancient times. Sometimes some other important event, and sometimes it was gravestones. So archaeologists have found many of these stelae, and some of them are really fascinating. And I'm eager to share that with you, but I feel like this is a good place to stop for the moment. 
And we'll look at a few of these stele and let maybe some more specific things the archaeologists have found in that video, okay? So let's pray and then we'll stop here and pick it up next time. Father, thank you so much for the people who are watching this video. And I pray that you would help confirm in their hearts that your word can be trusted. Your word is true. Thank you, Lord, for raising up the whole field of archaeology and many, many archaeologists to dig around in the dirt and find things that confirm that what we read in Scripture really is historical. So thank you for this, Lord. Help us to be better equipped than ever before to share these things with others and bring you a lot of glory and confirm your truth in our own hearts and in the minds and hearts of others as well. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Okay. Um, Carl, if you'd put the lights back on for me, please. Thank you. Um, so, kind of in your own words, tell me again what archaeology is. Yes. Studying Okay. That's a good... That's, Thank you, Katie. Yeah, that's really good. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. The the handout that I've got and what I put up here on the screen said the systematic study of past human life and culture by the recovery and examination of the remaining material evidence, such as graves, buildings, monuments, inscriptions, tools, and pottery. But that's a long definition to try to memorize. What Katie said is perfectly fine, as long as you understand kind of what it is. Number two. So what does it study? Okay, artifacts of, of past civilizations, yep. How people lived in the past, you might want to say it that way. You know, it, it studies how people lived in the past. Number three, how do they do their work? You've already said this too, but how do they do it? They dig, they dig, digging into the ground. Uh, I, I didn't talk about this in this video. I'm not even sure I'll talk about it in the next one. But one of the things that used to be fairly common, believe it or not, is uh, they would have, have a town or a small city or something, you know, and, and, and people would live there for a while, and then maybe some enemy would come in and destroy it, and then they would finally leave or whatever, and people would rebuild over that town, and it would just kind of be almost on top of the ruins below, and then they would, sometimes that would happen two or three times, so they'd have, in, in Israel, they call those places tells, T-E-L, and, and it's like a heap. It's like a, a, a little plateau or something. And you can dig down that and find different layers of civilizations where towns existed in the past. It's fascinating. Uh, so what's the common general word? You already said it. I've heard you say it several times that for the things they discover, what do we call the general word for these things? Artifacts. Yeah, artifacts. Number five, uh, I, I told a, an illustration of Jesus telling the Pharisees, Hey, you need to stop these people. They're 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 not being respectful here. They're not, they're they're shouting praise to you and everything. You need to tell them to shut up. You know what he told them? It, it would happen if the people shut up. The rocks will cry out. He said the rocks will cry out. If, if they quit praising me, the rocks will start praising me, and they'll cry. And he used the words cry out. So it's kind of like uh, uh, that's what's happening. The archaeologists. It's almost like the rocks are speaking as they, as they discover this information. Not literally, metaphorically, you know what I'm saying. So how does the age of archaeological study compare to the age of biology or physics or chemistry? Not very long, yeah. Now, you may say, well, 1800 sounds like a long time to me. Well, it depends on what you're talking about. <laughs> but, you know, compared to the how long men have been studying biology and physics and chemistry, that's a, that's a very short time. Um, and do you remember the man's name who's the father of archaeological ex excavation? William Cunnington. William Cunnington. You know, that's not a particularly significant name, except he's, he's kind of the one that everybody looks to, the archaeologists look to as, as him. So if you ever hear his name, you can think of archaeology. So what was the status of archaeology in the mid-19th century? It's just a hobby. Yeah, yeah, amateurs did it for the fun of it. Uh, why were many historians of the past not willing to trust the Bible for historical information? You, I mean, they'd, they, you understand what I'm saying? They would read in the Bible and they'd see the name of a town or they'd see the name of a people like the Hittites 
or they'd see the name of a an official or something like that. And they'd say, Man, I don't think that's really historical. I don't think we can trust that. I don't think that place really existed. I don't think that person really existed. I don't think. Why, why did they say that? Because they didn't have any other evidence besides the Bible. And why didn't they just trust the Bible then? Because a lot of times they'll trust a historical account of something by written by somebody else. Why wouldn't they trust the Bible? That's exactly the reason. It's supernatural. It's supernatural. And, uh, and let's go ahead. And, they, they objected to the miracles. They, no, this is the answer number 10, too. Why, why did they assume it was mythological? Because they had this anti-supernatural bias. They just didn't believe in the supernatural. They are materialists. And so number 11 says, what are materialists? Now, we're, now, we use the word materialist nowadays in two different ways, especially. We will sometimes talk about materialists, and, and they're related, but we'll talk about materialists who are really, really interested in the things that money can buy. You know, they, they, they want to buy things with money, and they're really interested in it. But that's not exactly what I'm talking about here. As a, as a school of thought, as a school of philosophy, materialism, do you know what it teaches? I'm sorry. Yeah, you can only trust what you can see or feel or or sense with your senses, and and uh, you know things that things are real, but spiritual things, no, they're not real. They they just believe that if you can't see it or feel it or touch it or hear it or taste it or smell it, then it's not real. That's that's their logic. Uh, so, just matter exists, not nothing spiritual. Uh, and of course, the Bible teaches very clearly that God is a supernatural God. He, he's the one that created this material world, but he's the creator and he's spirit. And so uh, materialists don't like that, although he's left all kinds of evidence that we're looking at in this course. Um, what is mythology? I'm sorry? Okay. Okay. Yeah, that really is. I'm sorry. You know, like false gods. Yeah, that, that, uh, that people really have made up a lot of stories about the past. Have any of you ever studied Greek mythology at all, or been interested in it? Some, it's kind of fascinating, I think. And some people like to study it. You studied it some. Uh, it's fascinating, and uh, and then they made up lots of fascinating stories. But you know, it's all fiction. You know, it's just not really true. Uh, they just made up these stories, even though they're fascinating stories. So we call that mythology. And, uh, and and they had these gods and goddesses, but it had no connection with history at all. It, just, it was just a mythological world there. Um, so what are some of the things that archaeologists, and the Bible's definitely not mythology because it is connected to history. And that's one of the things archaeology has helped confirm. What are some general things that archaeologists are able to confirm? Did, did you pick that number 13 up? Some general things. I've kind of alluded to it already. Yeah. Those people really existed. That's right. Those civilizations. I mentioned the Hittites a while ago. That was an example. Uh, the, the, the secular historians used to say, Hittites, they never existed. That's just somebody the Bible mythologists made up. And then archaeologists discovered, oh, yeah, the Hittites existed after all. And they did that. They've done that with a lot of different people and a lot of different places uh, and, and even people groups like that. And events, you know, there are wars that's that something that's that, you know, it's only talked about in the Bible, so it must have not really happened. But it did. They found other evidence now. Now they changed their mind. Um, so I, we, we, I guess a lot of this is repetitive, but, but so 14 is. How does archaeology help us obey First Peter 15, 315, which is to be able to give an answer to anyone who asks us a reason for the hope that's in us, Jackson? Uh, so how how does uh, uh, how does archaeology help us do that? I guess you've already said all of this, but can you say it again? Yeah, this is concrete evidence that the stuff in the Bible is not made up. It's just more evidence. It's just, uh, yeah. Um, so it, it confirms the history that we read in the Bible. Um, number 15 is pretty important, and some people can get confused here, but I think you picked it up because I called it out to you. Can it prove that God wrote the Bible? No, it can't. 
Archaeologists don't try to prove that God wrote the Bible. It is evidence that the Bible is, is not fiction, that the Bible is true. But, you know, from an archaeologist's perspective, if they weren't Christian, they could conclude that, well, yeah, the Bible is accurate, but they still don't believe it's God's word. You see what I'm saying? God gave us other ways to confirm that it's his word. Like, like what? Do you remember? I mentioned one of them in there. Do you remember what it was? Fulfilled prophecies, I think, a big one. We'll talk about fulfilled prophecies soon. Um, but it can't prove he wrote the Bible. It just proves that what it says is historically accurate. You remember what a stele is? Okay. An up, upright stone. There's something else to it. It's not just an upright stone. Yeah, it, it has writing on it. Yeah, it's engraved. So they used to engrave a lot of stuff. We do that too today. The most common way we do it, you see in graveyards, you know, tombstones are engraved, you know, so that they'll last. Uh, so people, many, many years, if they want to do some kind of genealog genealogical study, they can put it together by looking at gravestones. And uh, and so it's, uh, it's a tradition that goes way back. But used to, they put more than just, sometimes Sometimes you'll see that in cemeteries. You'll see a, a bit of history engraved, you know, occasionally, especially if it's a famous person. But uh, but but they often engraved uh, accounts of battles and things like that on these stele, or what the what the king did, some of his actions, some of his behavior. They were recorded. Um, so it's an upright stone slab with writing on it. Uh, and the kind of information? Well, I already answered that. Histories of battles, important events, gravestone information, that kind of thing. So here's the quick thing that I just gave you with the answers. And uh, some of you who came in late may not have gotten the original if you want it. Here it is. Jackson, you didn't get it, I don't think, did you? Savannah, did you get one of these? There you go. Hey, she's got uh, Katie's reaching for you, so you got one, didn't you? Okay. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, let's see. Um, okay. Oh, let's see. I think this other one. You know, if I started, I'd have to stop it. I think I'm going to quit here today. Do you have anything else on your heart or mind, guys? Oh, I'm supposed to go over with you the calendar for the next few days. Uh, let me remind you again. Um, this is the sixth, right? Yes. Um, so Thursday is pajama day. Pay a dollar and wear your pajamas. And next Tuesday, a week from today, is ugly Christmas sweater and sock day. And that's the last day of regular classes before Christmas. Now, on Thursday the 15th, we'll have a half day. You won't be in your regular classes, but if you've got makeup tests, or retake tests or assignments to turn in, you know, that, that's the deadline. You need to get all that done on Thursday the 15th. That'd be a week from this coming Thursday. We'll only be here till 11 o'clock. And uh, says upper grade Christmas breakfast. So if you'd like to be a part of that, you want to get here down for breakfast. Christmas celebration. Uh, last day for makeup work and school dismisses 11 o'clock. Any questions about the calendar? Everybody clear about that? All clear. Okay. Sometimes students say, well, what if we don't show up on Thursday? Well, if you don't have any makeup work, you don't have any retakes, you don't have any assignments to turn in, I don't think it could hurt your grade as far as grades are concerned, but you can miss some fun, you know, so it's kind of a fun day. Okay. All right. Anything? Anything else? All right, Father, thank you for these kids, and thank you for this time of the year. And Lord, we uh, it's, it's kind of an exciting time, and, and, uh, and uh, yet sometimes it's a difficult time, so I pray you give us grace.
Christmas for these days. And I pray that we will celebrate you well, that we will worship you well. We certainly want to celebrate the incarnation when you became a man and and chose to come and live among us and were tempted just like we are and yet without sin. And then you went to the cross and died on the cross for our sins, God the Son, and in the person of Jesus Christ, fully man, fully God. It's hard for us to even talk about these things, Lord, because we, our minds can't wrap around it very well because we know you're one God and that you reveal yourself to be three persons. And we know that uh, every time we pray, you, God, the Father, you, God, the Son, you, God, the Holy Spirit are all listening. And yet you're one God. So uh, we, we usually pray to the Father because that's what Jesus did. And so we do pray to the Father in his name. And we thank you for the way you reveal yourself to us. We want to understand you better. But we certainly want to celebrate the incarnation this time of year. So thank you for this time. I pray that these kids will learn as much as they possibly can and finish this quarter with, with strength. That they'll get all their assignments in and take all their tests, retakes if they need to, or makeups or whatever they need to do. That they'll finish with the, the, their tests and their, all their subjects strongly and study well and memorize what they need to memorize and learn what they need to learn. And then, Lord, I pray they would not neglect to learn what we're studying in here. I know it's easy to neglect it because I'm not giving tests or assignments, but I pray you'd help them to have an internal motivation to learn as much as they can just to obey you so that we will be able to obey 1 Peter 3.15. Lord, you're the one that gave that command to us that we ought to be able to make a defense or give an answer to anyone who asks us a reason for the hope that's in us. So I pray that we will do that, that we'll set Jesus Christ apart in our lives as Lord of our lives and be ready to give an answer so that others might come to know Jesus too. So please use us for that purpose and help these kids to learn these things. Right now, as we study archaeology, help them to internalize some of these things and remember some of these things so they can share them with others. Thank you for causing that to happen. Thank you for raising up the archaeologists. It's pretty amazing Lord, what you've done through them. So we thank you for the way you shut the mouths of those who are materialists and those who were secular, who rejected your word and just wouldn't believe that those things could have possibly happened because they were so convinced it was just myth. And thank you, Lord, for, con for establishing now very clearly that the Bible is history, it's not myth, even though it's obviously supernatural because you're a supernatural God. So we thank you and we praise you for what you're doing. So use us, teach us, help us to walk with you, to bring you glory the rest of this day in Jesus' name. Amen.